This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Shapeshift.io, the easiest, fastest, and most secure way to swap your digital assets. Don't run the risk of leaving your funds on a centralized exchange. Visit Shapeshift.io to get started. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, a cryptocurrency show. We are known for interviewing entrepreneurs, academics, and researchers in the blockchain space. I'm Meher Roy, and with me is... Sunny Agarwal. And today we have with us Martin Bessie, who is a researcher at Dfinity and is working on a project called Primea, which he describes as a next generation blockchain operating system. Um, we'll ask him, we'll get into what that means. But first, uh, Martin, could you uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background and how you got involved with this space? As introduced, I'm Martin Bessie. Um, I work uh, researcher at Dfinity uh, and um, I've been involved in this space since 2013, 14 probably. Before that, I was also I've been interested in Bitcoin ever since I saw the white paper, um, but didn't really start programming and getting heavily involved in it till uh, around Ethereum came out. Um, that was sort of uh, my initial initial step into this space uh, was uh, with Ethereum and generalizable uh, smart contracts. Cool. And so, you know, for a while when I first met you, I think you were actually still working at the uh, Ethereum Foundation. Uh, how did you uh, initially get involved, like take the step of like, you know, learning about Ethereum to actually like joining the foundation and uh, getting involved uh, from that side of things? So before the Ethereum Foundation, I was just working on uh, some of my own projects. Um, and I was trying to make a federated, I was trying to build federated systems. Um, so if you're familiar with Macedon, which is popular now, um, they're federated. They have uh, servers and you have an account in the server. But all the servers can talk to each other. So um, Riot is another example, or sorry, the Matrix uh, chat protocol. So you could have an account on one server um, and still talk to someone on a different server. So I was uh, working on a federated protocol um, and was thinking about how I could decentralize it a little bit further. Um, and this sort of led me to uh, re start doing research in blockchains. And the constraints I had could not fit into Bitcoin at the time. Uh, and when I saw Ethereum, I was like, well, this is really interesting. It's wide open. I can put anything I want on it. Uh, so I thought it'd be a good use case um, for Ethereum. And um, yep, yeah, so I just started implementing it. Uh, I I think it was early spring of uh, 2014. Um, I sat down and just started uh, implementing some basic data structures. So I started with implementing RLP and uh, it, if, you, if you don't know what RLP, RLP is, it's the uh, serialization format. Uh, and then I moved on to um, implementing uh, the Merkle tree. Um, and then finally built my way up to implementing the virtual machine and networking. Um, and I, I did this all in JavaScript. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's how I, how I kind of got involved with Ethereum. And so is this what turned into the like Ethereum JS library, which like, you know, I'm sure everyone who's like done some sort of development on Ethereum at some point has like played with at some point. So was that like that, that, that turned into Ethereum JS? Yeah, pre precisely. Um, so that's how Ethereum JS got started. Um, originally I was trying to, um, keep up with, uh, Gath and parity. Well, it wasn't parity at the time it was Ethereum. C++ or Aloth Zero. So originally it was just a client. It wasn't the libraries that everyone uh, uh, thinks about on Ethereum JS. 
And at, at the time, it, it, I had a whole client that could uh, even sync the blockchain, which is pretty cool. Uh, now there's more transactions, and it's a little bit hard to sync the whole blockchain. Um, but um, yeah, so it started off as a client, and then we sort of broke it off into a bunch of bunch of little little modules that became Ethereum JS. Cool. Um, and then, so I guess the thing that you were you're most famous for at World while at uh, Ethereum Foundation for working on is uh, the project called uh, Ewasm. So, uh, you know, stands for Ethereum Flavored WebAssembly. Uh, so could you tell us a little bit about what the goal of this project was and uh, why you chose to tackle the uh, VM problem as opposed to any of the multitudes of like exciting projects going on in like the Ethereum Foundation? Uh, the VM problem can be exciting to you, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, it was, I felt like there was uh, a lot of talk about these really hard problems like scalability and, you know, cool zero knowledge proofs and cool crypto. Um, but we were sort of lacking on just basic engineering stuff. Um, and, uh, nailing down like yeah some simple stuff that should be at the base of the chain I felt like so that's that's what I wanted to tackle the VM for it felt like no one it didn't seem it, it felt like no one really seemed interested in it uh, and there was a lot of room for improvement there uh, so the f number one rule of open source development is if you see a need that's that's what you should work on right um, so like, uh, yeah, that's, I saw a need there. Uh, so that's what I thought I should work on. So you saw some deficiencies with the Ethereum virtual machine, and then you saw that there was this other, other work being done outside Ethereum, which was the WebAssembly work. And we wondered if WebAssembly could be put into Ethereum as, as eWASM, right? So could you explain to us what, what deficiencies you saw with EVM and why did you specifically choose WebAssembly to, to repair them? Um, right, that's a really good question. So there's a lot of, I think the thing that, uh, that I realized um, that caused me to rethink the Ethereum. Well, at first I came into it thinking, yeah, Ethereum virtual machine is pretty cool. I had no knowledge of virtual machines or not much. I've never uh, implemented one before, hadn't really got into one too deep. So um, as well as implementing, the, implementing it, uh, I just kept seeing things like, oh, if this was different, it'd be a lot easier to implement. Things would be um, faster. And then, you know, you started, I started to research virtual machines a little bit. Um, and there's a lot of research on virtual machines. So I started wondering, okay, why aren't we using, you know, a virtual machine that is already in production that, you know, has really great implementations and things like this. Um, and this was... 2014-15, so this was really before WebAssembly was available. Uh, and what was out there at the time was Java, Java Virtual Machine, uh, which is, you know, it's a pretty good virtual machine, but uh, it, it's very complex. It has a lot of opcodes, uh, and it is not necess it's not deterministic in the specification of it. Um, so any virtual machine operating in the blockchain space, or more general, implementing or uh, any virtual machine that uh, is involved in symmetric computation. And symmetric computation is where you have multiple parties doing the same computation and needing to arrive at the same result. So whenever you have that situation, and that's what you have in a blockchain, you need to have a virtual machine that is always produces the same result with the same inputs. So it has to be very strictly deterministic. 
there wasn't a whole lot of options if that is your first if that is uh, one of your main concerns i was looking i was looking kept looking for something that could fill the need and there wasn't really anything out there when was it i think it was 2015 when Brandon Ike made the post about WebAssembly announcing it. Uh, and I got involved pretty early on just following discussions and commenting on GitHub and um, thinking about this as a possible replacement for the Ethereum virtual machine. In, like being involved early on in the discussions was uh, really interesting for me. I learned a lot from people that had been designing virtual machines for a long time. Um, and one thing I really the, that the that WebAssembly brought to the table that previous virtual machines hadn't was that it was deterministic. Um, it was very well specified. Uh, and it was a very it was open and simple standard and it had the same goals that virtual machines in the blockchain need and its goals were to be deterministic uh, to be uh, size efficient meaning the size of the program should be compact small um, and uh, um, have a ha have a minimal trusted computing base. So these are all things we need in the blockchain space. So I thought it would be a pretty good fit. What exactly would be like you know the main like what is the benefit of using the WebAssembly over the EVM though? So like you know you could say that you know it's just like two different bytecode formats. Like why does just switching the type of opcodes you're using and stuff give you performance benefits. I, I've heard you talk about like, you know, with WebAssembly, we no longer need uh, like, for example, pre-compiles and stuff. Uh, what is it about using a new opcode system that allows you, or a new VM allows you to like drastically change the efficiency and stuff of the system? Right, great, great question. So um, there's several reasons. Um, First of all, like WebAssembly is designed to be a virtual instruction set, which means <clears throat> it's a little bit higher level than individual instruction sets. So your CPU has uh, what's called the instruction set, which is just a list of base instructions it can understand and um, it runs. So we have these low level instruction sets and WebAssembly is a virtual instruction set that can easily map to all the uh, low level um, instruction sets uh, and you compare that to what Ethereum did is it didn't we didn't start from the premise of okay here are all the instruction sets and how do we make an instruction set that can efficiently map to all of them we just started with the premise of um, you know whatever was the simplest thing as possible just to get us running which was logical at the time um, you know Ethereum was a lot of work so there's no way we could spend one or two years just designing a virtual machine. Um, so that was the first, from, from a design uh, standpoint, uh, that was, that, 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 that is uh, WebAssembly spent a lot of time focusing on building an efficient instruction set. Um, on a technical side, some things that make WebAssembly faster than uh, EVM is the word size. Um, the Ethereum virtual machine has a word size of 256 bits, which real hardware uh, doesn't actually have. You have 32 and 64 bit um, operations. And the other thing is that the Ethereum virtual machine has uh, uh, unlabeled, um, has unconstrained um, jumps. So you can jump to random spots in the program, um, which is fine um, most of the time. Uh, but when you try to uh, translate a EPM program to native bytecode or native opcodes, um, native opcodes are Ethereum virtual machine stack based. 
And when you can jump around to arbitrary spots in the program and you still have to maintain the stack, uh, there's, there's no good way to produce a, uh, it, it becomes much harder to uh, write a program that uh, is called jitting um, that compiles to native bytecode. So WebAssembly, it fixes this problem. It can only jump to certain spots in the program. You have nested blocks and you only can jump to the uh, end of the block and that's it. So it becomes really easy to JIT uh, or write a program or, or translate a WebAssembly program to uh, native code. So uh, one thing I noticed was, um, you know, a lot of like the serverless computing people, like you know, people from Amazon Lambda, Google Cloud, they've actually been poking around like the uh, Polkadot re WebAssembly repos late lately, and so it's almost like a little bit like you know, they're actually depending on we, the the blockchain industry is depending on the like web industry to like kind of build stuff for us, but now it seems like a little bit the web industry is like kind of like depending on us to build it for them, and so it's kind of like you know maybe the tables have turned a little bit. What do you think about this, like? You know, maybe like h how beneficial has you, you think the industry support of WebAssembly has been? Yeah, that's that's super awesome. I had not heard that um, um, serverless people were poking around um, parity stuff. Uh, yeah, that's really cool. I'd love to see more of that, though. So, yeah, this started out for me like I wanted to bring better just development standards to the blockchain space because I felt like it was lacking. So the fact that, you know, um, you can get the same system, WebAssembly, to run in the blockchain and gets used uh, everywhere else, I think that's a that's a great sign that we're on the right track. Um, yeah, so shared effort. If we can have a common virtual machine that, like, lots of that has lots of use cases, not specific use cases in blockchain, but can also be used in serverless. Um, for example, Fastly, which is a CDN, is using it uh, to do computation. It's used in games and browsers. So it has, uh, we have lots of development coming in from all different angles uh, onto a common platform, and that platform gets mapped into a lot, a lot of different hardware infrastructures. Uh, and this is kind of, I think, uh, a waste-in protocol. Um, Juan Benet is sort of, um, I think, popularized that term when he talks about IPFS as being a waste-in protocol. Uh, but I think WebAssembly is also a great example of a potential waste-in protocol. So you try to uh, bring WebAssembly into as a replacement for the EVM I wonder uh, what was the reception, la so A, how far did you get in the development and B, what kind of reception did you have from the Ethereum Foundation for this work? So it, it met a lot of resistance to start with and, and you know, rightly so because like it was fairly new and no one knew what it was. Um, so yeah, it, it, it took some work convincing people and you know, whenever you make a change to a blockchain system that holds a lot of money or a monetary value, it shouldn't really. I don't. I don't think it should be easy to change like the core component of it. <laughs> so I, I don't feel like that's a bad thing. It, but we like we slowly gained mo mo um, momentum. The the I think the the big things. Uh, the big arguments that won out over the time was that it became obvious that we were going to keep wanting and keep needing to add precompiles. Uh, and if you don't know what a precompiled opcode is, it's a uh, opcode that uh, act, is almost like a, a contract in itself that just gets added natively. So in Ethereum right now, we have like different hashing algorithms as precompiled, and um, we have some precompiles that are used for verifying uh, zero knowledge proofs to do pairings and stuff. So each of these precompiles, the problem with them is they open up a large attack space. They can be really complex. Uh, 
So, for example, the ones, uh, the pairing, once that handle pairing, I believe there was a bug not too long ago that was found in Geth. I'm not sure if it was Geth or Parity anymore, um, but uh, it could have been a consensus breaking bug if it hadn't been caught. But the, the, the central problem still remains. You have, these are fa fairly complex programs, and you say, okay, this is going to be part of the specification now. Uh, so that every time you, for example, if I add a hash three as a precompiled, I have to add the specification for hash three to the specification of Ethereum. And that makes the, the entire thing much, much larger. Now, if we can have a simple instruction set that is efficient enough to allow us to implement uh, SHA-3 or any other hashing algorithm in the instruction set itself, we don't have to add SHA-3 as a specification um, to the Ethereum specification. We can just implement it in the base instruction set. Um, so what this gives us is a smaller, what is called a smaller, trusted computing base. And the trusted computing base is the amount of code you have to trust uh, for the system to run correctly. Um, so instead of trusting, you know, a SHA-3 implementation, SHA-256, these pairings, um, all these other pre-compiled code, all we have to trust now is the implementation of WebAssembly and we can run everything inside it. So um, I think that was, probably the, the, the largest argument for it. Uh, and then the, the second uh, argument that we like sort of briefly touched on earlier is that like, it's a, I think it's a waste thin protocol. So um, you have a lot more mind share being directed into WebAssembly um, from lots of different industries, whether it be gaming, web browser, or, uh, serverless, um, you have a lot of different people thinking about it and building common utilities for it. So it gets easier to develop over time. Uh, you get a wider or a wider variety of libraries, more development tools, more people knowing about it. And you moved to Definity and you started your, this new project, Primea, which is like the main theme of, of our conversation today. So give us a sense of why Definity in particular and what is Primea? It sort of isn't clear where I stopped EOSM and started Primea. They were kind of the same thing for a while, actually. So Primea was an implementation of EOSM or started out that way. Uh, we, should, we should talk really quick about um, EOSM and the fact that, so EOSM just took it doesn't change anything else about Ethereum other than the virtual machine. Um, and I started with that, but then I was thinking, okay, well, if we have an optimal virtual machine, what would it look like if, you know, we had an optimal or a better way for contracts to interact with each other? Um, <clears throat> and that's what Primea um, started out to be. Um, so I started changing I tried to like start with some small changes. Um, after the DAO hack, I became interested in adding something called uh, the actor model. And this was because the DAO hack was caused by something called a re-entry bug. And that's where a program like talks to another program, and then that program talks to the first program again. And what happens in Ethereum is you get a new instance of the original program with the same state and that can lead to confusion and the DAO and cause bugs uh, but that is not what happens in the actor model uh, every instance of a contract there's only one instance that stays around forever uh, or not forever one instance per contract that ever uh, exists so a contract might contract A might send a message to contract B and B might send a message to A again but a is going to finish this execution, then it's going to process the next message in its queue. So you never can get into this re-entry uh, situation. I, I started playing around with that after the DAO hack, 
Uh, Greg Colvin was also also sort of interested in that one. Uh, so we sort of talked about it and, yeah, started implementing it. And that was Primea. So Primea was basically like, you know, it came out of this idea of like, okay, this eWASM project's good, but it's like stuck with the backwards compatibility issues of or like trying to remain somewhat backwards compatible with the EVM. Uh, if not in like directly like the contract and call each other, but at least like in the programmer mindset of backwards compatible. And so Divinity was like, okay, what if we wanted to like, no, no, sorry, Primea was sort of like, what if we wanted to start from scratch altogether? Um, so the second part of, uh, uh, of Mahir's question was, so why uh, Definity? Why did uh, why why uh, move over to Definity to work on Primea instead of continuing to work on it within the Ethereum Foundation? Oh right, yeah. So that's really simple. It's just uh, there's no way to there's the easy path forwards to change the virtual machine in Ethereum. Well, easy, kind of easy. Um, it's still pretty hard. <laughs> Um, it's really hard to change anything about chain blockchains that are already running, especially when it requires a hard fork. It, it, it becomes near impossible to make a change that would break old contracts right in a chain. And that's what Premier did. It, it wasn't immediately clear or possible to represent all the old contracts if we made these changes. Um, things would have to break. So I actually spent a while trying to figure out how we could make this backwards uh, backwards compatible. Uh, and I just sort of gave up at some point um, and thought, well, it'd be a lot easier and we'd get a lot further if we just started fresh. Um, so, and yeah, that's uh, where Definity comes in. It, it was a uh, fresh chain, and it was doing some really cool stuff. Um, Dominic Williams was doing some really cool stuff with uh, Proof of Stake, I thought. So, um, yeah, so I joined efforts uh, with Affinity to, like, launch this forward. Uh, it's been really great, like, having a fresh table, uh, a clean slate to work on. You don't have to worry about backwards compatibility. It makes your life uh, a lot, a lot nicer. <laughs> this episode is brought to you by Shapeshift, the world's leading trustless digital asset exchange. Quickly swap between dozens of leading cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, Ether, Zcash, Gnosis, Monero, Golem, Augur, and so many more. When you go to shapeshift.io, you simply select your currency pair, Give them your receiving address, send the coins, and boom. Shapeshift is not your traditional cryptocurrency exchange. You don't need to create an account. You don't need to give them your personal information, and they don't hold your coins. So you are never at risk from a hacker or other malicious actor. Shapeshift has competitive rates and is even integrated in some of your favorite wallet apps like Jax. So you can swap your digital assets directly within your wallet just as easily as putting on your slippers. Whenever you see that good looking fox, you know that's where Shapeshift is. So to get started, visit shapeshift.io and start trading. And we'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epicenter. Now let's like maybe talk a little bit about what this whole actor model is. Uh, I, you know, I've normally always heard of like the, this analogy of these like mailboxes and stuff. Um, could you try to like maybe like break it down very simply what the actor model is and maybe how it's different than the current uh, model of smart contracts and the EVM and what are the benefits of it? The actor model is actually really, really simple, I think. Um, and, and you can think of them every actor as like a person really or an entity. Um, and People can usually, oh, at least me, I, I, I only can respond to one thing at a time. <laughs> so um, <laughs> an actor has a mailbox and um, you other actors can put messages in their mailbox. And each actor can take one thing out of their mailbox at a time and uh, designate what to do with that message. It can read it and then, you know, send other messages or do something. Um, or discard it, right? 
Um, so that's essentially what an actor, the, uh, the, the really broad model for an actor is. Uh, and what Ethereum has is uh, it's more like everything is compatible. Ethereum acts like one big program right now. Um, where you have a function in this program, every contract acts like a function and a function can call another function and that function, if it calls the original function again, uh, it's going to start a new instance of the function and with the same state. Yeah. So the, the, those are the, I think the big difference I might, I might try to make it a little bit more clear in Ethereum. Uh, when you have a program, it doesn't send a message to another um, program. What it does is make a call. And what that means is it pauses itself. So it's running, it's running, running, and pauses, sends a message. Now the other program is running, 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 running. And then if that program can send another message to another one, it's going to, both of those programs are going to be paused. And in the actor model, this never happens. Uh, programs don't pause or lock like this because uh, they always run, they get a message and they run to completion and then um, they grab the next message from the inbox. Two of the properties that uh, the EDM basically provides then in that case are the, these concepts of being uh, synchronous and being atomic. Um, could you actually, you know, maybe explain to the listeners that like, what are these two concepts? Uh, are they the same thing or what's the different or are they different? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, they're actually not the same thing. So asynchronous, synchronous versus asynchronous. So um, synchronous would be like if we, uh, let's say we're, we, we do this as humans. Um, synchronous is, would be like I say one thing to you and then I pause. And I, I'm free while you talk, and I can't do anything else. <laughs> so I'd be like, I'd be like, "Hello, Sunny." And then hello, be, hi. <laughs> yeah. So that's synchronous. That that's really weird. Humans don't act that way. Um, asynchronous is what we we're more accustomed to. Like I say one thing, but I keep on moving, and I keep doing things. Um, and then when you receive my message, you respond. Atomicity. Atomicity means, um, uh, let's say we all, all are trying to, um, if I want to convince everyone's opi opinion uh, or no one's opinion. So I try to convince you of something uh, and I try to convince, you know, uh, Alice of something and I want to convince both of you or none of you. And I don't want to be stuck in a state where one of Alice is convinced, but um, you're not convinced. And um, so this, this is the basis of sort of atomicity. Like um, I either can convince you to both and you're both committed or you're both not committed. Um, yeah. Does that, uh, explain it you think um well okay act, oftentimes atomicity is like the example used is this common um train and hotel problem uh maybe could you describe this like how that what that problem is and what atomicity means in that context right so the train and hotel problem is where uh i want to convince the both the train and the train company and the hotel company to uh, book me a, 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 a train ride and a hotel room, or I don't want to convince either of them because I don't want to be stuck in a situation where I only have a train but no hotel or in a situation where I have a hotel but no train. So that, that, that's the idea there. So if, if I'm understanding the story correctly, so you, you worked on the, um, on the EVM, you saw its flaws, but I think the first level of flaws you saw were in the addition of opcodes and things like that. But then you realize that, the, okay, they're like deeper 
like conceptual issues around how the uh, how the ethereum virtual machine runs and like these issues are uh, the first is the lack of an actor model which which essentially allows if if i am a contract and you are martin you are another contract me to call you and then i get paused but then martin you can again call me while i'm paused and a new instance of me will 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 spawn up and these two instances can basically conflict and that's what led to the dao bug so like so that's that's sort of one issue you realize the second issue it seems to me is in you you wanted you saw the need for a system in which contracts can keep executing sort of in parallel that's what I, that's how i understood asynchronous so asynchronous meaning that um, so martin as a contract sends me a message i process that message and i then move on to the next message so i keep moving on from message to message to message and then i don't need to depend on other things being complete in order to keep processing my messages right so you want to enable some functionality by which like contracts would just care about their inbox and like process message one do something that might lead them to create other messages then once that is complete process message two then process message three process message four and so on and in order to move from message one to message two to message three they do not need to depend on any other the execution of any other contracts so you felt like this this sort of construct uh, is needed in the blockchain space and then the third thing that i gather is um, you felt the need for contracts to do atomic operations so so maybe maybe a contract needs to withdraw money from a different contract and at the same time it needs to change data in a certain contract but that contract wants to ensure that both either both of these operations happen or none of them happen so the money gets withdrawn and the data gets set into two different contracts or none of them end up happening and so you felt like th that these three things are needed um so it's like asynchronous communication atomicity and the actor model and sort of this is what led you to build primea um yep and i'd add to that so um there's two things i'd add to that though uh that nails it pretty close but, um also scalability whenever you have sharding um you have asynchronous messages between shards there hasn't there's very few sharding well okay there's a couple sharding schemes that have synchronous messages between shards but i think those are kind of crazy <laughs> um so generally um any messaging between shards shards themselves are act like an actor right so you have a blockchain is an actor uh and you have a list of incoming messages and they're put in a mailbox and in a blockchain the mailbox is a block so you get a block and it has the messages and they're in ethereum ran one at a time so you could see ethereum as a single actor as it stands now uh and then when you add multiple shards now you have multiple actors each shard is an actor um in, i didn't so what i was thinking was like well if the shards themselves are actors why don't we just move that down a level and make all contracts an actor, right? And it'd be a more cohesive system. So now programmers don't have to think in two models. Because otherwise, you have two different models to think about. You have uh, one model if contracts are talking to each other in a shard, and then you have a different model for contracts talking to each other in different shards. Uh, and I thought that would be really confusing, so I thought we could simplify it just by having one one system aren't there what about like you know sometimes there are advantages to having systems that are like synchronous and atomic so like you know for example like why did the evm make like the design choices it did for example let's say you in 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 uh definitely you did want to solve the train and hotel problem and you wanted an execution to be atomic how would you 
make that happen now when we don't have like atomicity between contract like and program execution? Yeah, so that's that's a really good question. And um it does get a little bit harder to do um in Ethereum. So let's talk about why Ethereum did it. Um Ethereum was coming from the database world. It was sort of like looking at it as a stored procedure. So Ethereum is really easy to solve this. You don't have to do any special coding. Um, in Primea or Definity, uh, it, it's a little bit harder to do it. Uh, and uh, the way you do it is sort of like a two-phase lock. Now, um, we don't have to implement a full two-phase lock because we know everything, at least within a shard, is being executed uh, correctly. But what this means is, so uh, we send a message to the train company saying, hey, I'd like to uh, reserve a train ride. And the train company will give us back a... Uh, uh, a, a, to, a, a reference that says, okay, um, the, the, it, this is reserved. Do you want to confirm? And then you do the same with hotel and you get a confirm. And then once you get both the confirms, you, you confirm them both and you have them both reserved. Uh, so that's the basis of, uh, the lock system. Uh, and let's say if you sent you reserved a train and you get the confirm back and then you go to get the hotel and there's no room in the hotel you don't confirm with the train said you cancel um so that's the the, the very high level description of like um what it looks like to program uh, uh yeah atomicity on top of um this does this mean then you end up having to bake in some sort of like timing assumptions because like things have to time out at some time, otherwise you might get into like endless too general problem situations? Uh, it depends on several things. Whether you have to do bake in timing assumptions, I would assume um, some contracts would, you know, you would, you would say, uh, I would like to reserve a train and you would get back a confirm button that was valid for you know um a thousand gas or something or you know a thousand ticks or one block or two blocks or something like that right um so some amount of time and after that uh, it would be like yeah dropped uh-huh um and now what about the um you know the synchronicity versus asynchronicity side of things one of the like you know, things that makes JavaScript like kind of good, especially for the web world is the fact that it's generally asynchronous, but then it also leads into this like callback hell kind of situation that like people like hate. Um, how do you like Im help improve the uh, user developer experience on doing that? It, it, it is definitely a lot more complex for like developers to have to think through like asynchronous logic. Uh, yeah, totally. Um, and JavaScript, okay, so, but JavaScript is also probably the most widely deployed language, one of the most widely deployed languages, uh, and developers have managed to use it fairly well. Um, and taking a page from JavaScript, you, uh, JavaScript adds, um, in ES6, adds async, await, so, like, primitives that sort of make uh, asynchronous uh, easier to deal about and makes it look uh, more linear. Um, so that's the, I think, the simple way to do it is just provide better high-level languages. I see. Cool. So going back to the uh, actor model basics now, um, one of the things with an actor model is it usually, like, you know, the idea is that you have multiple, you're trying to run many uh contracts or actors in parallel and let's say one contract one actor ends with sending a message to a sends a message to b but also c sends a message to b um and it depends how it b executes depends on what order it uh received the messages in 
But what happens in the situation where on two different computers, in one computer A was faster, but in the other computer C was faster, and now you ha now you introduce some level of non-determinism into the system where on these two different computers B is acting on messages in different orders. So how do you uh, resolve this situation? Because obviously in the blockchain world we need absolute determinism. Yeah, there there's several ways to resolve this actually. And the way I implemented in Primea is uh, I count how long a program runs according to how much gas it spent. Um, so if you're familiar with Ethereum, gas can be spent in several ways. Uh, one way is through computation, the computation, uh, so like doing opcodes. Another way is through using memory or another way is storing things. So let's, if we, we only use the gas that went towards um, uh, computation, so the you know, opcodes, we only count that, that should give us some measurement of time if the gas, is, if the metering is correct or about correct. And that's debatable. Are you designing us in, in Premiere? Are you having different types of gas for like, you know, storage versus like, are these storage gas different than computation gas? But one of the nice things, oh, not nice. Sorry, one of the things I always found a little bit weird about Ethereum is it basically pegs the rate storage costs to computation costs. And, you know, I feel those two might need to fluctuate. Uh, is this something that you're doing, like keeping these separate, or are they still like joined in one gas counter? I still only keep track of um, the the gas that's used for computation, computation, as opposed to gas that's used for storage and whatnot. Um, but there's still only one gas count for you know a transaction. Now um, I agree that that might need to be separated out, but I felt like it was simpler not to change that right now um, and deal with that probably at a later time. So as it stands now, it's still bundled together at a high level. So I'm, I'm actually trying to get a sense of what Primea is, right? Like, so Primea is not a virtual machine because it's also espousing that contracts ought to communicate with each other in a in a particular way right uh, and that's that's functionality beyond the virtual machine so the virtual machine is like how a contract is executing but so it's not just a virtual machine because it all also involves this this design of how the communication ought to happen between contracts so yeah, so like the question becomes like, what is Primea? Uh, right. So that's a really, um, good question. So it's definitely not the virtual machine. Like in the implementation of Primea, the virtual machine is abstracted away. So you can use other virtual machines with it. Um, you could use like just JavaScript or whatever. Um, also, it is does not include knowledge about gas. Uh, it doesn't know anything about gas. It, it, all Primea is, is, um, a messaging system between actors. Uh, and we discussed actors briefly, um, but to review, they're just, uh, a simple program that has a mailbox and it does something. It can, it can receive a message, it can send messages, and it can create new actors. So those are the three things that actors can do. Uh, that's the most basic description of it, I, I would say. Oh, this is cool. So, so actually, the virtual machine piece is abstracted. You could, so you could, you could have like Ethereum virtual machines communicating in this actor style model, and Primea can enable that. But you could have Wasm machines communicating in this actor based model, and Primea can enable that as well, right? So, so. So it's almost as if like you are building something to which which doesn't map to a name in conventional 
like technological systems like it doesn't it doesn't map really well to the name virtual machine it doesn't uh what you're building is not an operating system it's not a virtual machine it's like a a model of communication uh yeah um it's pretty i think that it is somewhat closely related to uh micro kernels right and it's like a very small layer that says how programs can communicate and how programs can interact your operating system should keep programs you know their memory separated so they uh, a malicious program can't like take over another program's process right uh, that's the that's the core the core proposition value of operating system uh it keeps the uh programs in line doesn't allow one program to use up all the resources of the computer etc so it it's kind of like an operating system in that sense it's kind of not as in it's a little bit higher level like uh operating systems only when on run on usually on one cpu so it'd be like an operating system that uh, had virtual machines built into it i guess so yeah another like important uh design aspect of uh premia um is along with the actor model is this uh object capabilities system that you have um you know this object capabilities is actually something that you know became somewhat popular in the os world and then you're kind of like applying it here uh could you tell us a little bit about what object capabilities are and why you found it uh useful and important to implement them in primia oh uh, yeah so Object capabilities have a long history in smart contracts, like before the blockchain. One of the pioneers of object capabilities, Mark Miller, um, designed a language called Elang uh, that was sort of um, this, uh, that had a lot to do with smart contracts. They were thinking about smart con smart contracts in I think it was nineties early 2000s um, but long before the blockchain uh, and that was along with uh, Hal Finney and uh, um, some other notable cypherpunks and the idea of an object capability is uh, uh, a capability you have objects and they have some methods on it and a capability describes a transferable right to perform one or more operations on the given object. Um, so you can think of it in terms of uh, like a key. You can pass a key around and that gives you a right to open a lock or to perform the operation of opening a lock. And you can copy that key and you can delegate that key to other people. So I think that's a pretty good analogy for, um, for uh, capabilities. And so why is this, uh, why do you prefer this over the more traditional form of access control, which is ac called access control lists? Uh, why did you uh, choose to go with this model instead? Um, it's sort of just like, yeah, I, it was not for me a clear path. I started out with the actor model. It was my first step. And um, then I wanted, I knew that I wanted to be able to um, build secure zones of actors. So uh, I wanted to be able to use a program and I wanted to be able to isolate the program from the global world. You can't do this in Ethereum today. Like if I deploy a contract, any other contract in Ethereum can always message it. I cannot isolate it. I can't protect it um, from the outside. So uh, I started with like, okay, that that is really important to me. And the reason that's really important to me is um, I also want to enable uh, extreme modularity. I want programs to be extremely modular and reusable. This is also taking a page from JavaScript world. Uh, NPM has a ridiculous 
sometimes over overly ridiculous amount of modularity in it. Uh, I mean, there's like five no op packages um, on npm, which will be excessive. Um, I've actually used one before. Uh, <laughs> um, so you can't have any level of modularity in a high security or in a platform that needs high security if your your modules if they're deployed as contracts all need to include uh code that prevents them or needs to have extra code to prevent them from being invoked by um, parties that aren't supposed to um so i wanted to provide at a system level provide system guarantees of who can communicate to you um one way to do that is an access control list. I honestly don't know how you could design a system like this with the ACL. Uh, yeah. I never really considered ACLs in depth. Yeah. At least for this. So, yeah. I started from the point of view of looking at uh, continual uh, CSP and communicating sequential processes um and from there moved to the more of the actor model and object capabilities uh but acls you need what acl does instead of having a, a key the object themselves keeps a list of who can talk to it so that would be like me saying okay um Sunny, you can talk to me, as opposed to you just having a reference to me and being able to talk to me if you have the reference. Kind of like if I knew your phone number, then I am able to talk to you. Right, that's the capability, exactly. That's great, great analogy. Um, and so the central, one of the largest problems with that, uh, well, okay, in literature, there's a lot of problems with it. And I don't want to go into that too much because there's a long and complex uh, history that Mark Miller is the guy to talk to. But um, the reason for me I didn't choose it to implement it is added a lot of complexity. Object capabilities was a much simpler way to implement this. And uh, I thought provided a, uh, a much cleaner yeah, surface. Right, yeah. We're, so we're actually using a like object capabilities model as well in the Cosmos SDK. And one of the things I think I, what I noticed was um, the default of a object capability system is to fail safely while the default in access control list is to fail in a bad way. And so for example, I think the parity, both the parity wallet bugs were sort of a failure of access control list. Yeah, definitely. Like everyone's expect, Every contract is expected to implement its own access control list using these like modifiers, like only owner and stuff like that. And when you fail to do that, then you allow anyone to, the default was to allow anyone to like access functions of your wallet that you don't want to. Yeah, that, that's like pretty crazy. We're, we're dealing with money here and uh, yeah, I don't know. A few months back, we did an episode with, uh, with our chain, Craig Meredith. And to me, what Primea is trying to do and parts of what our chain try to, are trying to do look f superficially similar, right? In, in, in our chain also, there's this, uh, there's this concept of uh, that, that I won't call them actors, like there are, there are these processes sending messages over channels and to me, it feels like the, the R chain concept of process maps to your concept of actor and your concept of the inbox for each actor maps to the R chain concept of the channel. Uh, is, this, is this correct or um, there is some fundamental difference between these two models? Okay, so there are some differences. So Greg's coming from... Um, He's looking at uh, he's looking at his system is coming from the point of view of um, communicating sequential processes, and it's like 
more formal, it's a formal way of describing patterns of interaction in uh, concurrent systems. And yeah, um, uh, actor model is a concurrent system. So um, there are going to be a lot of similarities between the two. And that they, they probably have equivalence, um, though I not I don't know enough about CSP to say one hundred percent. Yeah, they're exactly equivalent. Craig would probably say no or something. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I was definitely I've hung out with Greg before, and I think it's really cool. Uh, I think my approach tends to be a little bit more engineering and he's a little bit uh, our chain is a little bit more uh coming at this from a theoretical and formal point of view um but yeah i think it's great work still yeah so give us a sense of what is the current state of primia and um, unlike other things in with dfinity primia is open source so developers can actually play with it yeah, this is, um, well, yeah, this is part of the thing where um, I started writing Primea before I, uh, before Definity. So it was sort of, I started writing Primea at the Ethereum Foundation. Um, so it was open to begin with. And I should say, like, well, the rest of Definity's code is going to be open. They're just uh, going to wait till the testnet launches. Um, and then at that point it'll be open. Um, so it's just like cleaning stuff up at this point. Uh, the state of Primea right now is it's being used in an internal test net for Definity, so it's up and running. Uh, seems to be working pretty good. Uh, yep, and you can it's on GitHub. Um, yep. yeah, the documentation is still lacking. Uh, we have some docs that just haven't been published. Uh, but yeah, that we, you can expect that at the, probably the end of the summer. Yeah. Have you, um, also been working on like higher level languages? So, I mean, obviously developers are probably not going to be writing in like WebAssembly bytecode. So have you been w working on like, you know, subsets of Rust or C or something that can like compile like a Primea flavored of Rust or something like that? Yep, definitely. We've been working on um, Rust and C and C++. So there, there's an SDK and it provides like header files for you. Uh, so if you've looked at like what Parity's done with uh, EWASM and uh, their tutorials on how to get started in Rust, uh, Definity will have something similar to that. It'll be pretty easy to get started. Um, yeah. So we're targeting those C and C++, I think, to start with in Rust. Um, also, ActionScript works, uh, but that's not a very full featured language. And we also have um, one engineer who is working on an internal implementation of Haskell that compiles to Wasm, which will be pretty cool. Martin, unfortunately, we have uh, come, to, come to the end of the hour. Um, I'm actually really looking forward to the Definity testnet, right? So like Definity is coming up with all of these, these new ideas, right? Like including the random beacon, including your, uh, the Primia system, uh, the Primia model of communication. And, uh, I'm really looking forward to being able to run a node on Definity and, and, and play with it. So, yeah, uh, Thank you for joining us today and walking us patiently through Primea. I think uh, I finally understood Primea after your explanation during the show today. And to our listeners, thank you so much for joining us. As you know, we release new episodes of Epicenter every Tuesday or Wednesday. You can subscribe to our show on iTunes, SoundCloud or other podcast apps like Stitcher for iOS and Android. And if you like to see videos, you can check, you can get the video version of this show at youtube.com slash epicenter Bitcoin. Recently, we have, we started a Gitter community in order to chat with our listeners. 
So you can check that community out at epicenter.tv slash getter. Finally, we love to have your reviews on Twitter or iTunes. So please do leave, leave us reviews there and we look forward to catch you next week. Thank you.